Good morning, uh, good afternoon, or good day, or evening to uh, to you wherever you may be. And uh, thank you for joining um, this webinar, which is brought to you by the Franchise Talk and Index conferences and events out of the UAE. Um, I'm very pleased to be chairing this webinar for Index and the Franchise Talk and to be joined uh, by some of my friends and clients uh, on this webinar, including Mr. Dehan Grabic, the owner and CEO of Museum of Senses, and Mr. Nad Mayan and Rich Hudson of Evolution Wellness, um, the owner of Go Fit and Fire Fitness franchise, uh, fitness brands, excuse me. And uh, the focus of our webinar today is emerging trends and emerging franchise brands. And I'm going to take 15 minutes to, to talk to you about some of the emerging trends and introduce you to some of the emerging brands. I'll hand it over to Dehan. He'll introduce his brand, Museum of Senses. And then Nat and Rich will will uh, have the final portion of the presentation to introduce you to two great fitness brands, Go Fit and Fire Fitness. Um, we won't be taking any questions during the presentations or in between. Um, at the end of the webinar, we'll turn the uh, stage over to, uh, to you to type in your questions, then we'll read out your questions and uh, the appropriate uh, webinar um, participant, myself, or one of the other gentlemen will, will do our best to answer your questions. And uh, we have an hour, um, so we'll move fairly quickly. Um, if there are questions that are, that are very specific that we can't cover, um, for example, you have interest in Museum of Senses, GoFit, or Fire Fitness, uh, we can certainly take that offline and communicate with you one-on-one, -on -one and, and I'm available one-on-one -on -one, uh, post uh, the webinar. So what I'd like to do is start my presentation. To do that, I'm going to share my screen. And I'm assuming everyone is now seeing my screen. I'm going to talk about emerging trends and franchise brands for the new year. And, and by the way, happy, happy new year to you, wherever you may be. Um, just briefly, I, I represent World Franchise Associates. We're a franchise advisory and consultancy company that has global reach. We're a UK company. We offer international franchise marketing sales programs. Uh, franchise development programs, investor advisory programs, and we do work for governments and, uh, and institutions in terms of franchise infrastructure structure and ecosystem development. Uh, my background, I'm, I'm originally from the United States, uh, 30 over years of international franchise development experience uh, across most of the regions and more than 70 countries, and I'm a partner and director in World Franchise Associates. So let's quickly talk about some trends. Um, these were trends that were, were trends um, pre-COVID um, and they're trends that will, will continue or are continuing as we leave the pandemic and, and move into 2021 and, uh, and normalization. So these are some of the franchise industry trends that are global in nature. And uh, the first one is international expansion, um, globalization, so to speak. More brands are expanding uh, beyond the borders of their own country and opening more units outside their own country than within. Um, and this is particularly true in America. Two out of every uh, three franchise units or franchises are open beyond the borders of the United States. Um, 
emerging markets are the biggest target. Some of the emerging markets are rated in the top 20 as most attractive places to, to do business uh, in franchising or to seek and find franchise partners. Please excuse uh, me, Troy. Yes. Uh, if you don't mind, can you uns unshare and share again? Because we can only see uh, the entire PowerPoint with the last slide. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. Thank you for, for letting me know. How, how is it now? Yes, we can see the franchise industry trends now. Thank you, Troy. Okay, apologies, everyone. So growing demand for specialized services um, is, is, a, is a continuing trend. Uh, health, fitness, and wellness is one of the, the big trends in, in franchising. Uh, Child-focused franchises, casual and premium, fast casual in the F&B sector. Uh, also in the F&B sector, growing demand for healthy menu options. Uh, there's a growth of mobile franchises, non-traditional franchises, which would include things like hotels, um, which were typically owner operated or, or joint venture operated are now using franchising and licensing models. And cloud and ghost kitchens have, have seen a big focus, particularly over the last 12 to 18 months. Um, and probably the biggest uh, trend is uh, the increased use of technology in franchising and across franchise business platforms. So some of the terms, I won't spend much time on this, but some of the terms that you were hearing um, in 2019 and you'll continue to hear are, are big data. Uh, we're in what's called IR 4.0 or Industrial Revolution 4.0, which is a cyber industrial revolution. And, and there's a lot of talk about disruption versus innovation. Uh, disruption is a, is a quantum leap uh, or a departure from from the way things were done, which which um, is always an innovation, but innovations are not always disruptions. Innovations can happen in small measures, but we're seeing more and more disruptions um, in the world we live in today. Um, the Amazon effect is a disruption. It's affecting retail particularly. Um, you know, you've probably all heard about the Amazon effect. Um, E-shopping and online shopping had probably its best year ever in 2020 uh, due to the due to the pandemic, and uh, and that trend is expected to continue coming out of the the pandemic and moving into 2021 and beyond. I'm talking about how times have changed. Um, this is the 10 most valuable brands of 2020, and uh, you can get different opinions on this depending on the source and the criteria but but i think this is pretty accurate and if you look below there's a list of 10 brands from 2000 they were the 10 top brands in 2000 and uh, and there's only one brand that's on both lists and that's microsoft and uh, just last week i read that that tesla has overtaken amazon as the most valuable brand so this this list which has changed so dramatically in in 20 years is probably going to change uh, very significantly over the next four or five years. And one interesting observation is the number of tech companies on the list now has increased significantly uh, over over 2000, and that will probably continue to increase. So how does technology benefit franchises and why is it important that franchises embrace technology? Um, it helps franchises use their capital and human resources more effectively provides franchises greater efficiency, uh, represents a logical evolution for the systems, tools, and processes that they've had in place for many years, and requires investment and adaptation. And although it requires an investment and adaptation, um, it's a pretty quick and pain-free um, adaptation now, and uh, not as expensive as it once was, and you can see your returns on your investment fairly quickly. And how does technology, how is it applied? It's applied to increase productivity, financial management, sales and marketing, training and development, customer service and engagement, 
uh, more than ever now, mobile work placing and telecommuting um, have become, become critical. Just some examples um, flowing from the previous slide. Um, cloud computing, um, the first picture represents cloud, a cloud system. Uh, more and more brands are using clouds and their uh, cloud systems and their franchisees are being given access to their, their uh, proprietary cloud systems. Uh, we're on a Zoom call now. I suspect Zoom is, is a pretty well-known brand worldwide um, right now. Um, the third picture is online education. Uh, that's emerging dramatically. Uh, technology is, is, is uh, facilitating that. Um, it's amazing how fitness has uh, been able to maximize um, technology um, in terms of online classes. Um, bottom left picture is a self-ordering cashless, um, uh, contactless ordering. Uh, you're seeing a lot more of that. Then, of course, you've got advancements in equipment. Um, you know, that machine, which is from UK's Costa Coffee, can put out a cup of coffee that many experts would think was made by a barista in an espresso machine. Um, the world is seeing an, a, a big upsurge in, in uh, third-party deliveries. Food Panda is just one example. Uh, you've got Uber Eats and many others. And then the last picture is, is Beacon uh, technology um, or proximity technology, which was uh, becoming very prominent in, in physical retail, uh, sends you a message um, when you walk by a product or, or a, a display telling you about what you're looking at or passing by. So just some things to, to consider moving ahead um, as, uh, as we head into 2021 and beyond. Um, in franchising, things that are being given more attention due to the pandemic and as a, as a result of the learning from the pandemic is that you've got to think beyond the box. So when I say beyond the box, the box is the four walls of a retail F&B or service establishment and delivery or finding a way to move your services beyond the box is going from nice to have to must have or have to have. Uh, flexibility. Um, I use the term glocalization, um, really more important now than ever. Um, liquidity, um, making sure that people are properly capitalized and have sufficient contingency capital to get through difficult times. People are realizing that um, there wasn't enough contingency uh, for, you know, for challenges such as the pandemic. Um, I use the word caveat on mTOR. I, I believe it's Latin for buyer beware. And uh, that's really not a good word to apply to franchising, but, but it, the point is that due diligence and planning are more, than important, more important than ever uh, for both franchisors and their franchisees to make sure there's alignment, uh, proper strategy, um, so that you build a strong foundation that can uh, be resilient. Um, Talent, there's more talent available right now um, in the global franchise um, uh, sector than ever before. So people are able right now to get good talent. Um, AOG is a abbreviation for acts of God. Um, you know, there was a very distinct definition for force majeure, acts of war, acts of God in many franchise agreements. It probably didn't change for 30 or 40 years. Um, certainly, I can tell you that the pandemic has made lawyers think about and business people think about the definition. And then, of course, I mentioned technology earlier. Those who don't embrace technology, um, we think, risk being left behind. And uh, 2021 positive outlook. Uh, momentum may need time to build, but there's a big consensus that the industry is going to rebound strongly in 2021. It's going to re recover faster than uh, many other sectors. Um, and this is shared by franchisors, franchisees, consultants, attorneys, um, and other industry stakeholders. Um, just a snapshot of four brands that, that fit into um, the emerging category, and then I'll, I'll pass it on to my colleagues or my fellow presenters. Um, Units is an American brand, 37 locations across America, servicing 150 cities. This is a use of technology in, in moving and uh, portable storage. Uh, their container systems and their, their lift systems 
allow people um, to move themselves and the containers fit in a standard parking bay. And this brand is a brand that's just turned their attention to international development um, in a sector where they have very little organized competition. Um, and we, we have high hopes for this brand in term, terms of supporting their international development. Jeff is a, is a brand that owns four brands and, and is developing more. And it's a technology brand which uses an app to offer laundry services uh, or to, to give people access to booking and, and uh, signing up for laundry, for, for uh, massages and relaxation, for fitness and for beauty. And uh, it's a Spanish brand that has more than 1300 locations and they franchise their, their different brands internationally or a group could, could acquire more than one brand. Then we've got Mathnasium. Mathnasium is the world's largest math learning center, um, 1,100 uh, units uh, from the US. Um, they have uh, pivoted very quickly to offer online uh, training and uh, home tuition, and they're actively seeking franchisees internationally after, after be, being considered one of the top uh, franchises in the education and uh, children's education sector in the US. And uh, finally, we've got Surf Lakes. It's a surf park and how they've embraced technology is the, they have a piece of equipment that they've developed along with engineers and surfers that provides the largest man-made waves in the world and they're looking for licensees and developers to, to develop surf parks um, in, in appropriate locations worldwide. This is an Australian company. Um, all of my clients are on World Franchise Center, www.worldfranchisecenter.com. Um, and on that note, um, again, we're, we also have uh, Dejan Grabic of Museum of Senses who will speak next. And uh, following Dejan, uh, we'll have uh, Nad Mayan and Rich Hudson uh, talk about GoFit and Fire Fitness. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to present to you. As mentioned earlier, we'll take all of your questions uh, once all of the speakers have, have finished. And uh, Dejan, I'll hand it over to you. Welcome everybody and a happy and a prosperous new year also from my side. Thank you, Troy, for an excellent presentation you gave us and an introduction. I would also like to thank the organizers, the Franchise Stock and Index for giving me the opportunity to present our emerging brand today. I must say I'm uh, very excited to, to, to be able to present you this amazing business opportunity called Museum of Senses. Uh, Troy was saying a lot about uh, future uh, and why franchise industry will, one of the, will be one of the industries to bounce back uh, the first, I definitely share his opinion. And before I start with uh, with presenting our brand, let me maybe just add a few things that will, beside what he mentioned, make entertainment industry, and this is industry we are in, uh, a very attractive one. And why entering now, I believe, is the right time to do it. Number one, at the moment, both the availability and prices of retail spaces and this is valid for both city center location as well as uh, as well as shopping center locations uh, are simply exceptional. The levels of prices and the level of availability we are seeing today uh, uh, was not seen was not seen for a long time, and this is valid more or less for 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 uh, valid across the globe. Uh, secondly, labor force in the next period will be available. Uh, so in tourism and in hospitality industry, you know, so this is very positive for, for, for any future businesses. Uh, uh, Troy mentioned act of God. Today, I believe we are all smarter in terms of how we negotiate our future deals. In our case, the, the biggest focus will go into the rental contracts because they are really important for, for our business and, and especially the cost side. Uh, Another very important fact is that based on analysis of previous crises and based on human uh, or consumer behavior after first lockdowns also uh, that happened and based on the additional research that is being done today on consumer preferences, uh, it is predicted that attractions, both small and big, but especially 
it's valid for the smaller ones, will gain popularity. So they will be one of the winners of this after COVID period because people simply will be keen to get out of the house, experience something new and simply have fun and, uh, as soon as they can. Again, related to the crisis, but maybe from a bit from a different angle, from our internal angle, this is, uh, there is the fact that setting up the museum takes six months as a minimum. More realistically, up to 12 or even more, more than 12 months, which in essence means that starting serious discussions and preparations and, and making initial investments now means that uh, uh, museums, new museum will open doors one the situation is, I think, safe to say, at least well under control. Probably not, not gone, but uh, uh, should be far more stable than it is today. So new, if you connect all of this, I think in few words, uh, it's, it's simply the now is the perfect time to enter this entertainment game. Uh, our story started four years ago. We opened the first museum in Prague in 2017, and then the second one in Bucharest in December 2017, two months after Prague, and then in 2018 and 19, we had the two new cities, Constanza in, in Romania and split in Croatia. Uh, the latest two were more like a pop-up museums placed in the shopping centers. We saw on one side fantastic results in terms of uh, uh, visitors, satisfied visitors, and on the other side, we saw very good financial results. So we were thinking, you know, because we saw the opportunity, this, this is our, our firm belief that there is a huge opportunity for the niche we are present in. And we were thinking then how to, how to grow, you know, the fastest to take as soon as possible uh, 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 opportunity that is out there. And the decision at the end of 2019, beginning of 2020 was made that we should do it via franchising international franchising. So, of course, 2020 was a very slow year in terms of growth, but here we are at the beginning of 2021, uh, really ready to conquer the world uh, with, our, <laughs> with, with the right partners at our side. So, what is Museum of Senses? In essence, it's an entertainment concept, so it's a hybrid between education and entertainment. We created an experience where visitors is sent on a journey to explore beauty of human senses uh, and all is done, the whole experience is done on a very fun, modern and especially interactive way. Uh, museums in terms of size, current ones, have around 500 square meters, but since we are using different zones and modules and units, uh, we have this maximum flexibility in terms of layout. So, uh, we can really adapt to the local specific, meaning if renting costs in, in, a, in some city are very high, uh, we could go with the smaller layout with 300, 350 square meters. And if the conditions you know, and, and potential is allowing it, we can go up to 1000 square meters. Uh, heart and soul of any museum, of course, also ours is the exhibition area and exhibits. Uh, in our case, exhibition area is divided into zones, each one for one of the human senses. In total, there are around 60 exhibits in each, in each museum and they come in different uh, uh, shapes and, 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 and sizes, let's call it like this. Uh, so they are in the form of specially designed rooms or standalone exhibits uh, or pictures, etc. In terms of concept, there are five main things that are important to stress today. Uh, Number one is, uh, uh, and the most important aspect is the interactivity. So whether we educate about sight, sound, touch, balance, we are all doing it very interactively because our goal is to create maximum engagement for the visitor and creating fully interactive exhibit is, we believe, the best way how to accomplish this. The second important aspect is that all experience that we are, we are designing are done on a basic level, meaning they are understandable to the widest possible audience, also to small children. Uh, of course, and especially very small children might not understand all exhibition and all exhibits are definitely not equally interesting to all family members, but we want that they all 
so every family member have enough interesting experiences designed for them. Um, another key aspect is the design. We are addressing this modern consumer and a very broad target, as I said, the broadest possible, so from small child to the grandparent. Uh, and with this in mind, then we designed the whole experience, so, you know, its duration, its interactivity, and of course, also the visual design. You can observe on the previous slides and also on this one that all the exhibits and interiors are, are how to say, bright, picture friendly. Uh, that is, as a first goal of this design, is to make the experience interesting for, for the visitor, as I said, for this modern visitor. But another goal is to create as much as possible picture of, of opportunities which are then hopefully, I would say luckily for us, also shared. And sharing the experiences is one of the key, key, key success factors of our concept, because it simply represents a very, very valuable marketing asset. I would say key difference, or one of the key differences between us and some other brands on the market is our approach to local culture and localization. Uh, uh, or location, sorry. For us, it is very important that experience and exhibits are localized. And we can execute localization on different levels. Here are some examples. On the right side, you can see this uh, uh, situation where we used uh, 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 localization on the design level. And this is picture with the boat, which represents the Nuba River Delta in Romania in the balance zone and the basketball player in the famous Optical Illusions aims distorted room. It's a local Croatian NBA player. So localization done on the design level. Uh, on the other side, you have the lady walking between the horses. This is the 3D anamorphic picture exhibit. So what is interesting is that this room was actually 200, 150 years ago used as a horse stall. So we decided to keep its, it, its purpose. So here we emphasize the historical element. Uh, in our localization efforts. Uh, and on the bottom picture with the, with the tubes, it's actually installation that talks about local winds that are blowing in split and people are trying to find out which wind they are smelling in the tubes. So here localization was done on the story level. So we have different levels on, on which we can operate this localization. Uh, uh, so storytelling and localization are one of the core things in our design vision. Why? Because we really want to make that every museum is special and unique. Flexibility of the concept I mentioned, but I mentioned it in terms of the, the layout that we can adapt to different sizes, but this is also true for different cooperation with partners. The concept allows actually integration. So it's actually so flexible that it allows full integration of brands into the experience. Here are a few examples we've done with M&M's and Skittles and with one distributor of movies in Romania for launch of, of new Transformer movie. Such partnership, you know, because they, they allow this full integration into the story and into the brand and into the experience can actually leave the experience. So they are not seen as, a, you know, somebody coming from outside just making a promotion like, a, you know, just brand pop up on the on the world. No, it's integrated in the experience, so it can, it can actually leave the experience uh, for the visitor. And also they bring additional revenues, which can be substantial from sponsors. And of course, they also bring marketing exposure, which is for pre, the, at least the part that the sponsor is doing via his, 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 his marketing channels and his budgets. Uh, in the middle, on the right side, there is a picture of a, of a pop-up concept that we developed. So it's another, so it's another uh, uh, concept. It was this one. The picture is from Mall in Timisoara in Romania, and and such concept can be used in your, in, let's say, in, in 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 your territory as an additional stream, like we did. We we rent out the exhibition for a time limited period to a shopping mall. Uh, but it could be also even used as a testing platform for a particular city to see what is the level of opportunity out there. Uh, so what are the key ingredients to our success? I mentioned this smart fund concept. It's addressing the modern consumer and it's operating in a low competition niche market. So really it does not get 
better, much better than this, I would say. Second, second fact why we are successful is definitely the, the fact that we have a very diversified sales channels. Um, for our bottom line, it's also very important that we have that we are targeting both tourists, but we are also targeting local people. Big part of our sales efforts and budgets are actually going to 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 addressing the locals, not only tourists. Uh, our strategy in all cities is to establish a relationship with all important global and, and local partners from ticketing, hospitality, tourism, you know, and other industries. We have a, another revenue stream which is important for us, which are school groups, uh, and also uh, uh, important are different parties we are organizing, birthday parties, team buildings, etc. I mentioned marketing on many many occasions during the presentation. It's another very key, I would say, key important key success factor for us. And beauty in our case of it is that it comes more or less for free. <laughs> Again, for this concept is responsible because it simply has this strong and memorable visual design. You know, it's shareable, it's Instagrammable. And besides, somehow we are opening this, uh, we are operating in this edutainment niche. And we are flying below media sales team raiders, raiders and we are getting a lot of free PR by doing so. Also, the name museum helps a lot in getting some things for free with the media. Uh, we are also high consistently on, on the TripAdvisor and Google reviews and Facebook reviews. So again, a lot of free exposure uh, via these gigantic platforms. And lastly, fourth success factor uh, of our model is, is the operating model. So without going too much into details, because really I don't have enough time to, to to do it today. Uh, I can only say that the operating model and museum management are lightweight. Really, the majority of, of success depends on selecting the right location, you know, then to design the experience correctly, execute flawlessly construction and initial setup. And if this pre-opening phase is done correctly, then operations afterwards are, are less risky and easier compared to practically any business model out there. Um, what is best, the best is that this pre-opening phase is fully managed and supported by us. So what can you expect by owning a Museum of Senses franchise? You should see revenues around $1 million. Uh, you should see high EBITDA levels and amazing ROI. And if all of this is done correctly, you will return the investment inside the first year of doing business. The numbers here are based on, on a ticket, adult ticket price of 10 euros, $10, sorry. So if, if some locations are allowing higher prices, then of course the results will be even higher. Um, what we offer, we offer a full package and our team will support you, you know, the whole way through the project. So we will provide you with a, with the full operational know-how transfer from site selection to design of whole experience to, 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 to the construction of your museum, extensive training, full access to branding, of course, and uh, advice and gu guidance on practically all operational aspects, such as I don't know, finances, staff, or operational management, etc. So franchises' responsibility, in essence, is to assure needed finances and then to implement all the steps based on the knowledge and practices that we acquired already. Uh, find good or, or even better, find great people and use the opportunities in the local environment to, to, to really maximize the results on the local market. So why I should invest into Museum of Senses? Because I believe that combination of everything that you see on this slide uh, makes us probably one of the best franchise opportunities in the entertainment sectors on the market at the moment. Because we offer, as you see, amazing ROI, high EBITDA levels, uh, I would say easy operations, and all of these with relatively modest investment. And with our full dedication to your success. This one is very important. We are a very young brand. Uh, we are just working our way into this franchise arena. So for us, success of our franchises and the first franchises even more is critical. So you can be sure you know that our only goal is your success. We have the concept, we have the team, we have the determination to make your story a success one. And as I said on, as, as I said on the beginning, 
I really believe the timing could not be better. So anybody looking to invest and, and grow inside the entertainment, entertainment segment now is the time. Rents are low, workforce is accessible, and an opening will happen when this COVID situation is uh, uh, well under control. And people, you know, are eager to go out, experience something new and have fun. So by this, uh, uh, I'm ending the presentation. I hope everything made sense today. If it did and your business senses are awakened, then, then I, my team and our partners at the World Franchise Associates would love to continue one-on-one -on -one discussions, uh, uh, you know, to determine the date of opening of Museum of Senses in your city. So, Troy, by this, I'm giving the word uh, back to you. That was a good start, wasn't it, buddy? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we'll go again. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our presentation. Um, we are going to introduce you to two of our brands today. Um, the first occupies the high value, low price segment of our industry, and the other occupies the opposite end, which is uh, boutique fitness. Um, a little bit more expensive, but a very unique personalized um, service offered for fire. Um, as Troy has said, uh, my name is Ned Mayan. I'm the director of growth and innovation for Evolution Wellness. This is my partner, Rich Hudson who is sales director for our brands um, in the licensing segment. A little bit about Evolution Wellness. We are the largest owner operator across Southeast Asia. We operate in six different markets currently. Um, Thailand, Hong Kong, Philippines, Malaysia, Singapore, and Indonesia. Um, we have six different brands in that space. Those brands include Fitness First, Celebrity Fitness, GoFit, fire and five elements <clears throat> over 170 clubs across the six countries with just over 300,000 members as they sit currently with over 6,000 staff servicing those members and we did about 25 million workouts for those members last year alone go fit as i mentioned right at kickoff is our high value low price proposition First club opened in Malaysia at the end of 2019. Um, great start out the gate. Um, we have built this proposition on technology. Um, first of its kind to enable the amount of technology that we have. The facility, despite its size of, what is it, 5,000 square, can be managed by one member of staff alone at any one time. So as I said, high value, low price, complete game changer. And the video will give you a little bit more of an insight. Let's go.
hope you all enjoyed that. I was just going to play it again because I enjoyed it. Um, so this is a little bit of data to share with you on the success that we had with GoFit. As I say, first location, 2019. We've had, since then, consistent month-on-month uh, -month membership growth despite the effects of COVID. Um, correct, yeah, mm -hmm. even in the last two months, growth has been um, sustained and greater than the budgets that had been applied to the club. So we're very pleased with how it's all come together so far. Um, we've serviced 78 and a half thousand check-ins since we opened. And don't forget there was a period of about four and a half, five months there where the club was closed in its entirety. Um, our NPS, which is net promoter score, so that's member feedback, <clears throat> has scored 89% positive reviews out of 5,405. Um, which is great for that space and in a brand new segment of the industry. We've got a number of signatures that we built and introduced to GoFit. Um, our aim and objective here really was to build a brand new proposition that gave us a lot to talk about in our space. You know, everybody's heard about a gym, everybody knows about fitness clubs, but with GoFit, our aim was to produce something that's completely new. So we created a number of USPs one of those is the super circuit, which is the opportunity for a member to get a full body workout, 30 minutes in and out of the gym, super fast. Another signature is the My Go Zone. My Go Zone facilitates personal training um, or small group training. So you can work out with a buddy in the space. Um, you stream from your own device, any of the content or programs that you happen to follow, and you get a dedicated private space in which to complete your workout. <clears throat> FitQuest is unique to us and actually exclusive within our brand. Um, outside of Europe, we have this unit exclusively within every GoFit facility, whether they are owned by us or licensed to any of our licensed partners. What's unique about FitQuest is that it gives the user the opportunity for a full fitness assessment in addition to body composition. You mean no more pinch tests, huh? No more. Oh. Unless you really want one, Rich. Um, our Group X studio also has been developed with technology in mind. We have no Group X instructors. Um, so all of the classes are determined by a virtual platform. Uh, those classes that are not scheduled. So if we don't have a scheduled class at any particular time and you want to jump in and try your own class, you can do one on demand. I love that. We also have a female workout zone. Sorry, Richard. Uh, um, and that is accessed exclusively off the back of the ladies uh, locker rooms. Now, what's nice about the ladies only zone, apart from the fact that we have seen an enormous amount of use of this particular facility in this location, yeah. is that we've also had a number of inquiries for developers to build a GoFit that is just for ladies only. Does it work? Absolutely. Now, as I mentioned and keep mentioning, technology is the basis upon which we built GoFit. We do not have traditional reception counters. All of the kind of trimmings that you come to expect from that mid-market fitness club, towels, um, you know, water dispensers, all that kind of stuff. We don't engage in any of that. We don't offer any of it. Um, access is through a QR scanner. The QR is your membership card on your app. Everything is controlled from your app. Um, whether you want to get in the club, leave the club, use my GoZone, um, use the FitQuest, uh, check your account status, all of that, or even the Hydra Massage, all of it is controlled through the QR scanner. Self-service kiosks, again, this helps to minimize any costs. We never have a member of staff turn up late because we actually don't need any staff. <laughs> <clears throat> now, vending, this is a really cool one. So I mentioned we don't do towels, we don't do water. Truth be told, we do, but we do it through a cashless vending system. Um, so you can buy your towel, you can buy a padlock for the locks, you can buy your water, protein drinks, whatever it is you need is available through cashless vending. Again, mitigating the need for any staff. Hydro massage, super popular feature within the gym. I think we have um, a large percentage of our membership base actually that will just stop by in the middle of their shopping in order to just get a hydro massage. This is perfect for rest and relaxation. Again, accessible by your QR code. Just some headlines on why we think 
GoFit is such a smart investment. Again, technology enabled. This will ensure that your operational costs are as lean as they could possibly be. We have a number of development opportunities, although they are being snapped up pretty quick. We've got a couple of interested parties in the United States, and we're just about to close a significant deal in a country in the Middle East. I can't give you any more details right now, but you'll be the first to know if you ask. Um, unparalleled business report, uh, support. Now, we have been doing this for a very, very long time. I know I look like a spring chicken, but I've been in the industry for over 25 years. And um, you've been in it for a little bit longer. A little bit longer. A little bit longer. A little bit older than you. Um, so, and across the world too. So we've not just been focused on Southeast Asia. Um, I have experience around the world. I think the only continent on which I haven't worked is Australia. And that's where my buddy Probably Rich buddy. comes in. Um, he's done every continent that I've done too, but he has the added benefit of Australia too, which okay. goes to show that he is actually a little bit older than me because he's been able to cover Australia too. Um, now your part, uh, as a licensed partner, we have exceptional um, experience and proven success in Southeast Asia um, as part of the Evol Evolution Wellness Group. We've been blessed with the opportunity to leverage Evolution Wellness in order to build and create these two fantastic brands that will provide the greatest opportunity within the fitness segment as they don't compete in the middle. They service the HVLP audience and the high-end boutique audience. Speaking of high-end boutique audiences, I'll now hand over to Rich, who will talk you through fire. Excellent. Thanks, buddy. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. A happy new year to you all. Glad you could make it today, and uh, we hope you're finding this interesting. I'm certainly going to find this next bit interesting, that's for sure. I want to tell you a little bit now about our second proposition, which is called Fire Fitness. Um, Fire Fitness is sits in the in boutique sector, and Nad was mentioning before that we have the high value, low cost, which is the low end, and for and we then we have the pr uh, premier boutique sector. Uh, then you have the middle, which is really where many of the gyms that you see today. Uh, and, and for those of you that don't know a lot about fitness, this is really important because these are the two. We talk about emerging markets. These are the very two biggest emerging markets, the two biggest movers right now in what you see in fitness. Um, I'll get to the video in a sec, but just a little bit about the boutique sector, just to give you guys some insight about it. <clears throat> Roughly now we're looking at about 40% market share. So 40% of the, the clubs that are, are now, the overall clubs built are in the boutique sector. And uh, the boutique sector really kicked off about eight, nine years ago. So for it to now be about 40% of total market share is absolutely huge. So it's had exponential growth. In some of the markets, you're seeing up to 70% of the membership base coming from boutique sector. So you ask, why is that? What's different about it? Well, because it's very friendly, it's got it's class focused. It makes it very easy for people who've not had a lot of fitness experience. On the other hand, it gives them a premier uh, experience and a lot of help. There's great community within that. Uh, and Fire is able to fit into downtown in LA. It also can hit out in any suburban. So it really is able to map all those different opportunities within it. But maybe it's best just to give you a little video so you can see exactly what Fire looks like.
I love that video. Yeah, that's a good video. We want to play it again, but we won't. Troy will kill us if we take too much time. <laughs> so just a quick glance for you guys. We started out in 2016. Actually, Fire was built um, by my two partners and myself. And we grew to two clubs before we then passed over to Evolution Wellness, who acquired the business. We now have four clubs in total here in Malaysia. We offer six different studios um, within that package. And, and some of the clubs have three studios, some have two, some have one. It all depends on what you have, the size, the space, whatever you want to offer. Which is quite unusual, right? Very unusual, which is one of our USPs and is very different against all our competitors out there. And that's what makes it so special. Within that, we house 14 programs. And those are some of the numbers that we put up in the last year, as you can see. I think what makes us really unique and makes us very cool right now, as I would say, is just very much when you look at our, the, how, how our programs are, are, are built, we can hit every single asset of, of fitness that you want, whether it's strength, whether it's recovery, whether it's cardio, it doesn't matter. They're designed in amazing studios. The studio is part of the experience and it depends what kind of CapEx you want to invest in that. When you go from the very high end, you can start at the very low end, which is all that doesn't really matter. We've been able, one of the greatest things I think about the business, if I look back on, on the last four or five years that we've been able to do, is we've been able to continually build uh, trainers who have had very little fitness trainer experience. They might've had a lot of fitness experience, but had never been in there and taught a class. I'm one of them. So, you know, if I can get there and be a, a fairly good trainer, then I'm sure we, we've done something right. Not bad training. Not bad training. Right? <laughs> we cater all levels of fitness. If you're new, you're old, you're young, you're old. It doesn't really matter. All the programs have regressions in them, and those are easy to coach. It's very simple. We're going to give you all those details and tell you exactly what the programs entail and with every single sign. All right, so just quickly, I want to give you guys quick headlines, maybe a, a minute on each one of these slides, maybe less. I just want to tell you about what those programs look like. Number one is Revolution. We are just about to launch Revolution here. We have a cat, it's, it's a category killer to one of our big competitors out there, um, but I'm not going to give them any headline time right now. But this program is built basically to, to encompass all different aspects of fitness. The program changes every single day. Mm -hmm. It is a hit workout uh, with cardio fixed in and is going to be an absolutely phenomenal option for people. Number two. Revolution, once again, we'll move on that. We have Bar. Bar has been out now for roughly about nine months. Um, I've got to be honest, when Bar came out and we were putting it together in our packaging, I wasn't sure it was right for fire, but I was incredibly wrong. Bar has just kicked it off and uh, with full classes in our Avenue K Club, where we are offering it right now, um, our challenge is creating more trainers to, um, to deal with the, with the request of classes so far. But you know this teach that? I'm, I could I could teach it, but I could teach it, but I don't look so good at tights. Yeah, <laughs> maybe, maybe I'll get around to it. Yeah. Well, we, what's really great about this workout is it's a dance workout with a hit inspired uh, part to it. And this has really got uh, what I thought would, would have been just a ladies focused class, but is actually we're having a lot of men starting to join as well, which is great. Nad, you can jump in. You'll enjoy it. Stride. This is our original OG, our old, old street gangster. This is the one that we started everything off or kicked everything off with. Basically what it is, you can see in the background, we've got treadmills, we've got weights equipment. So you're basically doing a high intense training workout with treadmill bursts, runs, different things like that combined with strength training. This is the, the base of our, of our classes. Next one is strike. Strike is, is probably, I would say overall, um, our second most popular class Ultimately, it's the Fight Club meets nightclub thing. And I'm sure you've seen a lot of this going around right now. What makes Strike really neat and different is the atmosphere it's in, um, the way we put the class together. It also, it can, can be behind with HIIT training, with weight training, uh, and purely, it's just, it's just a really fun boxing atmosphere, which is really becoming very, very popular today. And you need to book early because his Saturday morning class is always full. I don't know why. <laughs> Ride, Ride is, is uh, the second class that we came out with is incredibly popular. I'm sure you're all very familiar with cycling, indoor cycling. We have our own touch to that. Um, we have a very intense ride training course or class, which is about 30 minutes long. We add in some HIIT training, some yoga, all kinds of different things that just keep you off balance on your bike and uh, make it a really fun workout. 
Uh, the last one and my favorite workout and what ultimately is probably our most popular workout right now, I would say force. Force is a low impact power strength training um, program, uh, which helps you to also do increase your cardiovascular work because you're doing high intensity training with high repetitions. It is an absolutely phenomenal class for any age. And what makes it great is you get PT training, personal training the whole way through the class, which makes it a very safe environment to roll into. Very quickly. So what makes us what makes us unique? What makes it a great ROI for this investment? Number one, we've got a whole bunch of different variety of studios that you can pick from. And I, I don't know if you picked it up in the video. We have literally from 75 meters up to and including 500, even 500, depending on how many studios you <laughs> want to go. Unparalleled support. Nad mentioned that before. One thing I can tell you, um, which I know for sure in speaking to many franchisees out there who own franchise or licenses, they're really looking for support. And sometimes they get into these businesses and they're not quite sure what they're getting into. We've designed our training um, so that it is absolutely A class and we'll make sure that we're going to support our licensees like nobody else. That's one of the main things that we focused on in building both these, uh, these different uh, fitness offerings. And that's all delivered online. Online with our app. instructors apps, right? Exactly. And an easy learning tool for them to grow and for us to be able to help uh, those trainers overseas as well. Yeah, very cool. So very low complexity, low operation expenditure. Um, our, our tech side of it, as Nad was talking before, we believe is as good as, or is it is better than anybody out there. And I think when you put that all in mind, it makes it a very, very exciting offering. I think basically that's it. That's it from us. If you need any further details, please jot down our email and um, hit us up with any questions um, outside of the questions that you have an opportunity to ask next. Thank you, Troy. Thanks, Thank Troy, you all for you, your buddy. attention. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Ned and Rich. <laughs> We are uh, we're a little bit tight for time, um, but I think we have we do have time for for a few questions, and uh, I can see that some of you have sent in your questions. Uh, I'll start uh, Dehan with questions for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, there are several questions, but they they they're all of a similar nature. So I'm going to ask you all of the questions at one at one time. So. Um, what is the ideal size required for a museum of census? Um, how many, I guess uh, the question is how many um, different experiences or, 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 or uh, exhibits do you fit in the ideal museum of census? Mm -hmm. And uh, what type of revenue streams does uh, Museum of Senses uh, have in addition to selling uh, entry tickets? Mm -hmm. Thank you for the questions. Uh, so uh, the, the size of the museum first, uh, at the moment, all of them that we have are around 500 square meters. But as I said, uh, if a city, you know, if the rent conditions are extraordinarily tight, let's say the prices are, are high, we could go as low as 300, 350 square meters or on the other side, it could go also up to 1,000. But let's say, for example, of 500 square meters, to answer the second question, uh, uh, we can fit between 50 and 70 different exhibits, where big part of them would be, let's say, the, on the level, let's say, in the in the form of pictures. Uh, but the main one, the ones that are carrying the whole experience, you would be uh, fitting up to 10 of them, which are which are really, you know, the the, the triggers. Um, the third question about the, the, the besides, I mean, for the revenue stream. So besides the B2C selling tickets, uh, I mentioned this experiential marketing. This is cooperating with the brands. This is quite unique because actually the, the concept allows integration of the brand into the experience. I was showing, actually, I was not showing, I apologize also for this. I've heard that the, the presentation was not working properly, that uh, we were stuck I don't know, on one of the first slides. So I do apologize if the, the, the organizers are telling me that uh, presentations will be available to everybody. So anybody interested, we, I will be more than happy to, to share the full presentation. 
so experiential marketing, so cooperating with the brands, it could be huge in terms of revenues, but also in terms of additional marketing effect. Uh, then we have schools. Schools are a big part of our revenues, uh, which comes on the, these educational tours. Uh, uh, birthday parties we are organizing, or I would say birthday parties in the parties sector are, are the biggest, but we also organize different team buildings, etc., uh, special events. Uh, so this is this is these are main revenue streams besides the the, the tickets on the reception. Thank you. That was all very clear. And and one more question. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the type of relationship you're looking for with the partner, um, mm -hmm. you're looking for, would, would you define it as a franchisee or a licensee? And uh, is it for a country exclusive or would you do individual uh, museum of senses with, uh, you know, for example, someone that had a location in Dubai Mall in downtown Dubai, mm -hmm. could they could they do a license just for that that mall? We are more thinking over uh, about the franchise uh, system, less the, the, the license, the license one, but we are open to discuss in terms of, you know, our main main goal is to grow globally. And this is the decision that we make. So we will grow also by by our own network. So we are investing we are continuing to invest in, in our new museums, but also we would like to grow with partners because there are these local specifics uh, and the local touch and the local knowledge, which is important. And of course, the, the we need the speed to take this, which we really think that it's a huge niche. So we would like to, you know, take as much as possible as soon as possible. So the four, I would say, is less important. We are willing to discuss, but we are not uh, too much thinking about the licenses, to be honest. But we are open even for a revenue, you know, for a different uh, joint venture partnership even. So the forum, again, we are fully open to discuss one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. And, and I, I think I can answer this uh, next question, and that is that uh, all of the GCC countries are available for Museum of Senses. Yeah, right? we have some discussions, but uh, the region more or less, uh, yeah, we, we are, it's open, it's open completely. Thank you, Dehan. I'll, I'll uh, move on to uh, Rich and Ned now. Uh, guys, the, the first question is, uh, is uh, about the, the equipment and when you sell the licenses or, or you grant the licenses, um, do you also supply the equipment? Um, specifically, I saw FitQuest mentioned in this question. So um, we do not um, make money on anything that we don't do. And we don't make equipment. So what we have been able to do through our years in the industry, um, through leverage of the group, uh, we're able to secure the best prices in the market. Now, we are that transparent in how we operate. We encourage for the licensee to have a direct relationship with the equipment supplier. Um, as soon as the equipment supplier is aware that it's either go fit or fire, that then activates a particular pricing structure that we guarantee is the best in the industry. Yeah, we've negotiated those. Well, Nat's done it. He's some pretty good ties. Um, and though that pricing will be better than, than anyone anywhere that they can get. So we're quite confident in that. And uh, we want to make sure we pass that on to our licensees. Excellent. The, the next question is about the type um, in the GCC particularly. Are you looking for, for master licensees per country? Um, what, what type of uh, alternatives are available if someone is interested in, in one of the GCC countries? Yeah, I think, you know, we're, we're up, we're up for whatever. We're, we're looking for master licensees, a couple of countries we haven't got there yet, um, but we've actually, we're in negotiations right now in two of those places with masters. So we, we know there's many ways to structure a master agreement. So we're willing to discuss any of those options right now and happy to have those discussions, no matter what level of the interest there, there is um, and, and make sure that we can and see if there's something structured. 
Great. I, I guess it depends on the on the capability and the quality of the partner, the uh, scope and scale of the opportunity, I suppose, right? Absolutely. I mean, you know, the thing, Troy, is that we've really worked on the training aspect and, and the app. And, and I think, you know, you know, we're a big company. We're in six countries. Um, we're not in every country around the world, but we certainly have long tentacles. You know, um, we I've been in Asia since 2001 uh, and also 18 different countries I've worked in. And that's the same. So, you know, we have a we understand what's happening in many of the markets so we can actually support people. And I think, you know, that's really underestimated the importance of that, of understanding the market, not only your own product and the impact and, and how people can be successful in those different markets and what it takes, what the competitors are like, what's there, what's not there. So, you know, we have some, some pretty yeah. good intel and all that. Yeah. And look, I think, I think that, you know, there are multiple opportunities out there. I think that our industry has never been in the position that it's in today, ever before. It's almost like the perfect storm. You know, whilst we've had the, the inconvenience of the closures, what it has done is it's drawn a great deal of attention to the importance of good health and fitness. Yeah. Now, as things start to normalize, the demand for fitness facilities is going to be higher than we've ever seen before. However, during the period of closure, unfortunately, there have been a number of operators that have fallen by the wayside, that have had to close their business, that have gone out of business in its entirety. So we're actually going to have fewer facilities available to the public and hence the enormous opportunity that we have in front of us. That coupled together with much more attractive um, lease rates is the perfect storm. So yeah. those that have the foresight, the fortitude and the finance to start moving now are going to be the big winners in this space. Yeah, for sure. I suppose the uh, silver lining in the COVID cloud from a from a franchise um, standpoint, or one of the silver linings is, uh, as as Dehan mentioned and you just mentioned, is is uh, real estate prices um, and availability of real estate um, in places like Singapore and Dubai, where everyone was effectively working for the landlords in 2018 and 2019. Um, that dynamic has changed, um, I think, to the benefit of of brands like those that you you guys represent well exactly troy you know i think if you want to look into the hourglass or look sorry look into the future a little bit with COVID, is you, you can take a look at some of the countries that are, are winning against COVID. there's not many but take new, new zealand for example um you know uh, property prices are now starting to come back up uh and those opportunities that were there before are now disappearing but the good thing from our side anyways on the fitness side is fitness is starting to boom in New Zealand. And it's amazing to see the inquiries that we're getting from there, but also other brands. So, you know, that's going to happen. If you're thinking of doing this, now is the time, no matter, you know, what you're in, is to negotiate those leases to speak with us so you're ready to launch and kick off when the opportunity comes, which won't be far. Excellent. Um, we're we're already 10 minutes over. There's There's one last question, which I'll answer on behalf of the of all of the speakers it's about the the franchise fees and and i don't have the full context of the question but i believe it's it's suggesting that or asking if franchise fees should be lowered um, or reduced now due to the the pandemic and I, I think the answer to that is that that would you invest in a franchise uh for for any of the brands we talked about um today you're effectively investing in, in an agreement that typically is, is 10 years. Um, and you're not just opening one shop typically, you're, you're building out a market. And, uh, and the franchise fee is, is for the right to use the license for 10 years and it's for ongoing support and, uh, and for the uh, ongoing access to, to uh, initiatives and uh, enhancements in the brand. So while there may be some discounting of fees um, because of the pandemic, I, I think that, that more likely um, the stronger your argument if you want to acquire a franchise and your business plan and your, and your strategy, um, these are the things that are gonna compel people like, like GoFit and Museum of Senses and Units and Mathnasium 
uh, to be more flexible because if they have more confidence in you and your ability to develop their brand and their market, um, you know, they're going to be more comfortable uh, with the relationship and how they negotiate. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, it's, it, it, there's a different perspective, um, but uh, you're dealing with the long-term investment and a, a long-term contract. So certainly um, the, the pandemic is going to be well behind us um, before you even, you know, start scaling the business and operating the business in your market if you acquire the franchise in, in January or February. Yeah, so absolutely. absolutely. Right, right, guys? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We're willing to talk. We're willing to talk. Beautiful. <laughs> so um, I, I guess we would all uh, like to uh, thank you. Thank you all for joining us. Thanks to... Uh, Wissam and Iswarya and the team at Index and the Franchise Talk and uh, wishing you a very good uh, good day or good evening wherever you may be and, and all the best for a, uh, a prosperous and healthy and happy 2021. And again, uh, we're all available if you'd like to talk to us after this uh, webinar. Um, we're all accessible by our email and, uh, and you can contact um, the franchise talk to get in touch with us um, if you haven't been able to take our emails down. I believe the Thank next. You all. Thank you. Thanks, and uh, I believe the next webinar, if you're looking at the screen, is uh, is titled "Unusual Franchise Concepts." There'll be a completely different team running that webinar, which is taking place on the 9th of February, 2021. And uh, please do please do join. Uh, the franchise talk for that Tuesday webinar in February. Thanks to all. Very good. Thanks. Bye-bye. Stay safe. Bye. Cheers.